So I'll be going over an update of our PED uh, studies at the university. I'm under Bob Morrison here. Uh, just a quick outline of the studies that we have. Um, uh, basically, we have a lateral spread study um, in which we're taking two approaches uh, to analyze um, basically how PED uh, goes about spreading between farms. Uh, the first approach, we're looking at identifying index cases and then um, subsequently indicating, uh, identifying their nearest neighbors and seeing whether those nearest neighbors do become positive or remain negative. And then uh, our second uh, approach to this would be a cluster analysis in which we're looking at PED spread um, in a very prevalent area. Uh, some of you caught the keynote address actually yesterday um, by Luke Dufresne. Uh, basically, we're looking at Oklahoma Panhandle region. And then uh, another study that we're going over right now is our production impact. Um, uh, we're also looking at a time of stability study as well as I'll just go over at the end a little bit about our swine health monitoring project. Uh, so about the lateral spread study, um, this is a National Pork Board funded project, so thank you National Pork Board uh, for accepting our proposal. Um, like I said, we have two approaches. Uh, the first approach with the incidence in neighboring herds, we're looking at the uh, index cases in negative areas and uh, basically identifying the neighbors by a questionnaire. And if those neighbors end up becoming uh, positive uh, or end up remaining negative, then we have that, uh, the comparison between the two. Um, and basically, every single farm gets this questionnaire administered. Um, it's looking at different risk factors uh, or potential risk factors that could be associated with PED. Uh, basically, it's um, a variety of biosecurity uh, things where we're talking about transport, um, how many times a truck may have gone on the site in the two weeks prior to infection. Um, how many times a uh, different type of visitor would go onto the site. Uh, we're looking at disinfection protocols within the site and also at the truck washes that um, they may be using for the production system. Um, so there's a variety of different uh, uh, questions to evaluate there. Uh, the second part, we're looking at the cluster analysis. Is As I said before, uh, PEDB spread really fast um, in Oklahoma, uh, as you probably saw in the keynote yesterday. And uh, they're just wondering what could possibly be um, the explanation of this. Is it aerosol? Is it kind of transportation pests? Um, it didn't seem like it was a common source between the multiple production systems down there. Um, so it really wasn't that uh, explicable. Um, so what we're doing there is we have 268 premises participating in our cluster analysis, which we've already handed over to the folks at USDA APHIS, um, Center of Epidemiology and Animal Health. And uh, they're basically taking it and running with it and uh, doing spatial analysis to look for kind of a pattern of movement that we might be able to see for this particular virus. Uh, to go back to the uh, index farms and neighboring farms, I just want to give a small update on our progress. Uh, we have both retrospective and prospective cohorts in this group. Um, as it says here, we've got 22 case farms that we've actually identified, 19 of which have verbally agreed and then 14 of which we've actually gotten to enroll, enroll officially and who are actively participating in, uh, in filling out our questionnaires and everything. Um, this is kind of a, a even more brief update on what we have fully, fully completed um, in terms of getting the index cases and the questionnaires filled out on that, as well as all the neighboring farms uh, having their questionnaires filled out. And uh, it's just a quick look at uh, the percentage of neighboring farms um, that remain negative that we have so far, and as you can see right now, it's at 100%, and it's remained at 100%. Um, so none of the neighboring farms that we have so far out of our five index cases have actually uh, come down with PED. But that's, again, another reason why we need so many more uh, index farms to test. Um, that's why we're continuing to plug away and get as many questionnaires still, uh, done as possible. Um, I'm certainly aware of uh, some neighboring farms to our index farms that we just haven't gotten their questionnaires completed yet that uh, have become positive. So it's going to be really interesting once we get that data in and can plot it on this kind of survival chart here. Um, so before we move on to the production impact study, I first of all just want to thank uh, everybody um, involved with the lateral spread study. It's been very, uh, it's, it's been interesting getting everybody's participation and, and I've gotten a lot of uh, good feedback from everybody. Everybody's been very uh, helpful in getting me the information and filling out the questionnaires. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that all of the participants, uh, which I'll list many of at the end of this uh, presentation. So uh, to move on to our production impact study, uh, basically we're looking at um, breeding herds undergoing exposure programs, which at this point if you're breeding herd with PED, you are going undergoing an exposure program. Um, and uh, the baseline parameters that we're collecting in order to evaluate uh, the production impact on these breeding herds. 
are basically piglets weaned per week. Um, so we start with the piglets weaned per week, uh, and then we, so the data that we're collecting is um, piglets weaned per week post-infection. Uh, but the data that we're using for the controls is the 26 weeks of that data prior to infection. And we're analyzing that using a sewer control chart. So we're establishing what the baseline production is, and then um, uh, giving upper and lower conf uh, I'm sorry, uh, confidence intervals in order to actually say what our uh, parameters are to determine whether or not that production goes outside of the norm. Um, so the end game is to identify a really time to baseline production that we can say on average between all these farms that are enrolled, um, as well as just try to characterize the loss of PD. If you have a sow farm, how much are you going to expect to lose? And so uh, many of you who might be on the uh, mailing list for the Swine Health Monitoring Report have probably seen uh, this graph here. And what I'm showing is the, uh, the weeks post-infection on the x-axis here with uh, basically this region being our control area. Um, of the 26 weeks prior to infection. And then this is uh, post-infection basically starting right up here. So um, we've set baseline production at 100% so we can compare each farm. And then we have our uh, upper control limits and lower control limits here as established by the control data. Uh, so basically you can see that the farm data dips down. This is an average of all of our 18 herds. Um, you can see that it dips down basically uh, kind of like what you've heard in all of the reports of PED. Um, but it's nice to see it actually happening on a graph. And uh, from this, we've gathered our average time to baseline production uh, from starting to lose all your piglets, going down to absolutely producing nothing, um, to coming back up and actually producing what, you know, what you're supposed to. Uh, we've seen that that takes about 5.9 weeks after the initial uh, detection of the infection. And of course, the 95% confidence interval of 4.2 to 7.6. Um, so the loss that we can really characterize from these numbers is, uh, well, we've, we've put it into numbers of um, pigs per thousand sows, and it looks like you lose about 1,700 pigs uh, per thousand sows in a farm. Um, and really that converted to uh, what might be kind of an easier way of people thinking about it is, uh, you lose about 3.9 weeks of production. And so that's it's kind of shocking to think about that a whole 3.9 weeks of, of all your piglets just being lost over the course of that entire break. Uh, I'll just go over the uh, time to stability study kind of briefly here. Um, basically what we're looking at is uh, breeding herds again undergoing exposure programs and how long it takes them to reach stability from the time that they have detected infection and then subsequently uh, started their whole exposure. Um, so the criteria that we're evaluating for stability is uh, basically that they need to be free of clinical signs and then the testing protocol is we're expecting them to have four samples of uh, PED, PCR, uh, negative samples at, at weekly intervals. So uh, we would expect four weeks of testing, and then uh, after which, if we got all negatives, they're considered stable, um, start considering introducing uh, the sentinel animals at that point. So um, basically, we have at least, uh, uh, for the sampling protocol, uh, we want to at least get 30 litters uh, sampled. And basically, we're looking at one swab or even a swiffer per litter, and then all those uh, samples pooled together. Um, for five litters, so we're ending up with basically six PCR submissions. And, uh, and of course, the bias of the sample towards um, basically increasing the sensitivity as high as possible. And so the results of uh, this study so far, we have four sites enrolled that are actively testing. So it's kind of an interesting spread. Um, as you can see, site one uh, was positive at 12 and 14 weeks still. Um, at this point, uh, the next test would be the 16th week of their break. Um, that we'll have to see what happens. And uh, Congratulations to Site 2. They've already um, actually reached stability at 18 weeks post-infection. Uh, and the rest of the sites are kind of mixed results. So um, we have many more on the way that will be uh, following from the initial point of their infection. And it's going to be really interesting to see the results. Uh, from here on out, basically what we would do with this data is to compare it to the different methods of exposure that uh, various production companies and even smaller farms have employed uh, in order to see kind of what the best method is. Um, uh, there have been all, all, actually a lot of different ways to do it, and kind of what's your recipe for feedback? Um, are you exposing gilts on, on introduction of the farm consistently, or did you just expose everything and then close the farm? So uh, comparing all those different variables. Take that picture. <laughs> um, so now I'd like to just talk about the Swine Health Monitoring Project. Uh, it's kind of a, an overarching project that we've been establishing throughout the course of PD. Um, and basically, the, the question that we're trying to address is what will be the next pathogen across the border into the United States? And whereas 
Whereas, uh, like Albert said in, in the keynote presentation yesterday, um, Albert Rivera from the University of Minnesota, um, I think we did a great job of responding to PED, but at the same time, we can always do it faster. We always should strive to do it um, faster and better and prevent the spread of it as much as possible. Um, so basically, I think that that's more of a, a question of having the infrastructure to do so. Um, so with the swine health monitoring project, uh, the idea is to get um, farms participating and, and uh, assigning BDL release agreements, which would confidentially allow them to uh, supply their premises ID um, into a confidential database, which would then be linked to BDL results, and as well as linked to GPS coordinates in the national repository. Um, this then would be used if, uh, in, in the case of the next kind of big uh, pathogen coming to the United States, um, we already have then the infrastructure set up. Uh, we can go ahead and say, you know, yes, we can track this between all the farms that we have in our in our database. So um, this is in the process of being set up. We already have uh, almost 300 farms set up uh, to actually share this information. So um, I'm sorry, 300 sites in uh, in a variety of production systems um, set up to actually share this data. So it's really exciting. <laughs> Uh, I don't actually expect you to be able to read this, but it's just an example of the swine health monitoring report that I'm releasing as a part of the swine health project, uh, swine health monitoring project. So as you can see, it's a two-page report, and basically the first page I released a lot of uh, update information on studies that I'm doing, on studies that other people are doing, um, and, and just hope to keep people up to date, uh, veterinarians in the field, participants of my study, really anybody who asks and wants to have this sent to them, you're welcome to. Um, the uh, second page of the study is then uh, basically just an update of the um, National Animal Health Laboratory Network uh, collated data sources from the veterinary diagnostic labs and their reports of all the recent accessions throughout the week. Um, so it's just kind of a, a quick overview, a weekly report that I released that allows you to see the progression of PED in the United States. Uh, this is just one of my favorite representations of how to actually visualize PED, so I thought I'd show it briefly. Um, you can just see the progression through uh, the United States as we go uh, from all the way back in April when it first arrives to uh, very close to now. And um, then we have the most recent uh, map right here. So again, just an example of, of what I actually released in my swine health monitoring report. If you want an actual copy, go ahead and let me know and I'll send it out to you. 